And it was easy to promote that book because it's the single best book on the subject that's ever been written, in my opinion. And I'm glad that Dr. Belcher uh, brought us two together. I think he knew right away that we would hit it off and be friends because we think so much alike. And I've learned a lot from Jeff. I feel like I really understand my theology and the theology of our Reformed Baptist forebears a lot better. He's taught me a lot about covenant theology that I thought I knew and didn't reading his books. And so I'm much better grounded in the faith than I was before I met Jeff, in my opinion. But uh, today, Lord willing, we'll make our way through a couple of verses of Galatians. And uh, in order to try and get a handle on Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2, we're going to begin reading all the way back in chapter 5, verse 16. And we're going to read through chapter 5, or 6, rather, verse 5. And I've given you an outline that I made this morning for you because it dawned on me that, as is prone to happen with me at times, my outline got away from me and took on a life of its own. And I was afraid you wouldn't be able to keep track of where I was. Uh, I was having a hard time keeping track of where I was in my outline. So I figured you might as have the same problem. So you have an outline there that's been passed out to you that I hope will be a help for you to really be able to pay attention to where I'm headed. I'll begin reading, as I said, in chapter 5, verse 16. I'll read all the way through chapter 6, verse 5. And then I'm going to pray again and ask the Lord's blessing. I just can't preach without calling out to God myself. I'm too scared <laughs> uh, not to pray. Uh, so beginning in chapter 5, verse 16, we read, I say then... Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Now I'm reading from the New King James. I think the ESV might do that a little better. I think it says something like, for the flesh, its desires are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. I like that better um, because lust is a negative term and it applies to both sides of this. Uh, so... Our flesh, is, its desires are against the spirit, but the spirit's desires are against the flesh. So there's this battle going on, this spiritual warfare, because these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dementia, uh, dissensions, excuse me, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So whatever it is to be a spiritual person, it's none of those things right? Instead, it's these kind of things. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, which become important for us this morning in our, in our verses, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Let's pray. Holy Father, having read these verses, we see that there's a lot of spiritual truth here. A lot to take in. And as we focus our attention on these first two verses of chapter 6, 
I just pray that you'd fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we might understand what it is that you intended to say through your Apostle Paul, our dear departed brother. We thank you for the way that you used him, inspired him to write these words for our benefit. And because of that, we know that we can hear you through the power of your Spirit speaking to us through these words. But we're reminded, Lord, that just as we couldn't come to faith in Christ, we couldn't see or enter the kingdom unless we were first born from above, born of your Spirit, neither can we continue to grow in our understanding of spiritual things without reliance upon your Holy Spirit. So we humbly ask for the filling of your Spirit and for wisdom. Give me clarity of thought and largeness of heart, as Bob Gonzalez is praying for me today. Clarity of mind and largeness of heart. Give it to all of us, I pray. Help us to be good hearers of your word, Lord. Give us eyes to see, we pray. Give us ears to hear. Give us hearts sensitive to the leading, the prompting of your spirit. Quick to obey. We ask these things in the name of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As I was looking over these verses and praying over them, I was reminded that these days it is not uncommon to hear people say, I'm a spiritual person. I think I heard Madonna say that once. I've heard pop singers say that. I've heard actors say that in interviews in the college campus where I've done some ministry in Bloomington, Illinois, or rather in Normal, Illinois. It's where the actual college is. I've heard students say this. Well, I'm not religious, but I'm a spiritual person. What they mean is I don't go to church or I don't care anything about anything like that, but I'm a spiritual person. Now, I'm not sure precisely what is meant by that statement when people make it. And I'm not altogether sure that they know what they mean when they say it. But the Apostle Paul, he talked about people who are spiritual, and he knew exactly what he meant when he said it, and he expected the people who heard him and who read this epistle to know exactly what he meant when he said it. So although the people around us today who like to talk about spirituality and claim to be spiritual people might not have the slightest clue what that is, we do have a very good understanding of what it means to be a truly spiritual person. And we're going to discover more about that this morning in the passage before us. We're going to begin to see what Paul means by use of the term, because in our text he says it's the spiritual person who can and should restore a brother or sister who's struggling with sin. And so we need to understand what he means. And we're going to begin to see it backing up into the text where Paul has described the Christian life, as we've seen, as a battle between the flesh and the spirit. That's where we began reading in chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, when he said, I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then he says, the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the spirit, its desires against the flesh. And there the spirit is the Holy Spirit, by whom we battle the flesh. These are contrary to one another. In fact, he's talking here about these, in the tenses he's using, of a constant desire of the flesh against the spirit, and a constant desire of the spirit against the flesh. And he's talking here about how they're constantly opposed to one another. It's not like the spirit is only sometimes opposed to the flesh and the works of the flesh. He's always opposed. And it's not as though our flesh is only sometimes opposed to the Spirit. Our flesh is always opposed to the Spirit. This is a constant opposition. This is the nature of the Christian life that Paul's talking about here. And he depicts it as though it's this constant conflict, this constant battle going on. Not surprisingly, then, Paul goes on to stress how crucial it is that we follow the Spirit's leading if we're going to have con uh, victory rather in this conflict. 
In verse 25 of chapter 5, he says, If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Now, as we saw in verse 16, where Paul had already commanded us to walk in the Spirit, and then also spoke of being led by the Spirit, uh, he was emphasizing the active role of the Spirit himself in our lives. And in those statements, as well as the one in verse 25, Paul used the present tense to denote this continual or habitual walking or being led. Because we're in a continual battle, we need to be continually led by the Spirit, and we need to continually walk in the Spirit. This is something, as I said, that characterizes the whole life of the believer, day in and day out. And all of this is setting up the passage for us in the context in chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, because this conflict involves some casualties along the way sometimes, and great difficulties, and the need for us to help one another along the way. But in verse 25, still kind of building the context here, Paul used a little bit different word for the word for walk that he used in verse 16. There he had said, walk in the Spirit, and he repeats the command in the English. It looks the same way. He says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit, in verse 25. But there, it's not the same word. Peripateo is the word that he used before. That's a common word for walking. And it's used metaphorically of the Christian life. How we live our lives. But in verse 25, he shifts to a more specialized Greek word. Stoicheo is the word. And this literally means to be drawn up or advance in line. To belong in ranks. It's a word that would be used of an army that's marching in ranks. It was used of soldiers marching or advancing in a line. But it's used figuratively here with a sense of walking in the steps of the Spirit as he leads. He's sorry, so he's pictured the Christian life as like a battle. And we have a commander, we have a leader that we follow. And we keep in step with the Holy Spirit as we go day by day. So the ESV study Bible, I think, is on the right track when it says that this verb means to walk in line behind a leader. Right? J.I. Packer is also close to the mark when he takes it to mean that we must keep in step with the Spirit. In fact, he wrote a book by that title based on this verb. G. Walter Hansen has even been so bold as to say this. Keep in step is a military command to make a straight line or to march in ordered rows. The Spirit sets the line and the pace for us to follow. Keeping in step with the Spirit takes active concentration and discipline of the whole person. We constantly see many alternative paths to follow. We reject them to follow the Spirit. We constantly hear other drummers who want to quicken or slow down our pace. We tune them out and we listen only to the Spirit. So he's kind of taking the analogy there and running with it a little bit that Paul seems to imply in using the verb. Again, he has taught in this passage that we're in kind of battle with the flesh, in which the flesh sets its desires against the spirit, and vice versa. And in this battle, we need to learn to listen to the spirit's every command. And of course, we see those commands in scripture. The very scripture we're reading this morning gives us some of his marching orders. So this walking in the Spirit seems to be similar to the way a soldier follows his commander, heeds his commands. But, you know, soldiers have packs to carry, right? And I'm not sure if Paul intends the analogy he's implied through the use of this verb and, and the way he's described this Christian life to be taken quite that far. But I do know this. He goes on to talk about... We saw it in 6.5, we all have to carry our own load, and he's talked about how we have to bear one another's burdens along the way. So I know he has some idea like this in his mind. And so we come to the central command of today's passage in the beginning of verse 2 of chapter 6. Bear one another's burdens. Burdens. 
And we're going to find out what he has in mind as we seek to unpack this command. We want to ask as we think about this, how? How should this be done? How should we bear one another's burdens? In what way are we to bear one another's burdens? We'll see that I think in the context here, Paul says that we should bear one another one another's burdens in two ways. One, by restoring others. And two, by loving others. Both of these ideas appear in these verses. Paul begins by giving a specific application, restoring others, and then goes on to focus on the general principle behind it, loving others. And so we're going to follow that same order in our examination of the text. We'll see first that we must bear one another's burdens by restoring others and then by loving others. We see, of course, that we must bear one another's burdens by restoring others in verse 1, where Paul speaks of restoring one another. He says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Now, when he gives the command to restore one another, Paul here is using a Greek verb that basically means to put in order, to restore to a former condition, or to mend, or to repair. It can have all these nuances in the New Testament. It was used in the Gospels, for example, to describe the disciples mending their nets when they were broken. It was also a technical term, a medical term used to refer to setting a bone that had been broken. So we can understand why it could have this figurative use to describe restoring a sinning brother. The late uh, James Montgomery Boyce applied the term this way. He wrote, The verb is a medical term used in secular Greek for setting a fractured bone. What is wrong in the life of the fallen Christian is to be set straight. It is not to be neglected or exposed openly. John Stott also offers some helpful observations about the implication of this command when he writes, Notice how positive Paul's instruction is. If we detect somebody doing something wrong... We're not to stand by doing nothing on the pretext that it is none of our business and that we have no wish to be involved. Nor are we to despise and condemn him in our hearts. And if he suffers for his misdemeanor, say, serves him right, or let him stew in his own juice. Nor are we to report him to the minister or gossip about him to our friends in the congregation. No, we are to restore him and to set him back on the right path. Or as another author has put it, the overtaken ones need to be restored. They are not to be ignored. They are not to be excused. They are not to be destroyed. The goal is always restoration. I think these gentlemen have a good handle on what Paul is talking about here. Restoration is indeed the focus Paul wants us to have. But he not only commands us to restore one another... I think he provides some crucial information that we're going to need it if we're going to fulfill this responsibility. He says something about who should be restored, who should do the restoring, and how the restoration should be done. So we're going to look at each of those. You can see why you needed these notes. I'm going to have subpoints and subpoints before we're done here. Paul tells us who should be restored, and we see it in the beginning. Of verse 1. He says that one overtaken in any trespass should be restored. Now, it's important to realize here that this Greek verb translated overtaken means to overtake by surprise, to overpower before one can escape. It's a fairly strong term. And I think the use of this verb probably indicates that the person is not deliberately or remorselessly sinning. But even if he is deliberately sinning, the idea is that he's been caught in the sin or trapped in the sin. I don't think then that Paul intends for us to be constantly confronting every possible sin that we could find in a brother or sister in the Lord. In fact, if that were the case, isn't that all we would be doing? I mean, we wouldn't have time to do anything else. If if you were going to do that for me, believe me, it would take up All day, every day, I think, for you. 
and I hope some of you at least feel the same way. <laughs> uh, well, I'm really terrible. <laughs> um, I, I hope I'm not alone. <laughs> um, I think Paul, though, he, I think he wants us to confront any trespass in which someone's been overtaken. This certainly means that any nagging or persistent sin that we see someone succumbing to, some, especially a besetting sin, that we shouldn't let it go. It's cruel. It's unloving to do that. It hurts everybody when we do that. And he doesn't want us to do that. Instead, we're supposed to seek to correct and restore the person caught in it. You know, most of us, even if they're, maybe they're sins in, that we have in our personality and the way we talk to others, and maybe we can be abrasive, for example, and we don't realize it. That doesn't seem like a big sin, right? It doesn't seem like a major thing. We all put up with that. We're all patient with one another when we're abrasive. But what if you get somebody that's like that all the time? It's easy to just overlook that. Love covers a multitude of sins. And so, eh, I'm abrasive a few times. My wife's going to overlook it. And he'd get up on the wrong side of the bed. He'd sleep very well. She's going to overlook it because she loves me. And, but what if I'm like that most of the time? See, I'm overtaken then. I'm caught in it. I'm trapped by it. And I'm probably not even realizing it. So I need her then to confront me as a good help me. Why do I use that example? Well, because sometimes in my past, I could be abrasive once in a while. I needed to be confronted. I don't know about you, but I've had some nagging sins in my life before. and Somebody needed to help me. And I'm glad I've had people around me over the years that could do that. Of course, one of my other nagging sins is sometimes I don't like to listen when people try to do this. Uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes that's hard for me. And so, guess what? There's this nagging sin of pride then that needs to be dealt with. So that I could be more humble and take correction better. So I'm just giving you some ideas here of how we might apply this. Even sins that seem small, if they're persistent, if they're nagging, they can be a real problem. Paul says, you got to deal with those things. You got to help each other. Your brother or sister is caught that way. You got to rescue them. You know, bear that burden and restore that person. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that your spirit inspired Paul to say that. I need that. You need that. What's more, we need to be responsible to do this. Sometimes it's easier to have somebody do this for you than to have the courage to do it for someone else. So that's who should be restored. The person who's got this, they're caught in a sin. Secondly, Paul tells us who should do the restoring. He says that those who are spiritual should do the restoring. Now, given that he uses the plural here when he says you, plural, who are spiritual, without any further qualification, I think we may assume that Paul is not referring to a select few here, but to the majority. He doesn't say, you leaders in the church, restore such a person. You older people in the church, restore such a person. He just says, you in general who are spiritual, restore this kind of person who's caught in a sin. I think he's presupposing that there'll be plenty of people in the church who can do this. I think we also shouldn't think here that Paul has in mind different classes of Christians, as though there's some spiritual Christians and some non-spiritual Christians or something like that. I think instead he has more the idea of maturity in mind. I think when he says that those who are spiritual should do this, I think he means those who have attained a basic level of Christian maturity and consistency in their walk. If we recall the preceding context, and we'll go back before chapter 5 where we read earlier, I think we can say a number of things about those who are spiritual. So we've got subpoints to subpoints coming up here. So pay close attention to your notes there. 
First, I think we can say that the spiritual are those who are trusting in Christ alone for salvation. You don't qualify as spiritual unless you start here. You need to be able to say, for example, with the Apostle Paul, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes to the law, then Christ died in vain. You're not spiritual unless you start there. Salvation by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. Nobody's spiritual if they can't say that. Secondly, the spiritual are those who have received the Spirit by faith. Remember, for example, Paul's earlier challenge in chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? So the spiritual person realizes they come to faith in Christ by God's power, by his grace, for his glory, and they recognize that they've received the Holy Spirit also by faith in God and by his grace. That's what a spiritual person is like. Thirdly, the spiritual are those who are walking in the spirit and battling the flesh. We've seen that in chapter 5 when we looked at verses 16 and 17. I say then, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desires against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. So the spiritual person recognizes that they're in this battle. And they recognize that they need to depend upon the spirit for victory in this battle. Also, the spiritual are those who are demonstrating the fruit of the spirit, as Paul said in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, which he'll bring up here in the spiritual person who needs to confront someone caught in a sin. And self-control, you need that too, lest you be tempted as well. Against such there is no law. And then finally, we could say, and you could probably find some other things if you comb through this book, but we could at least say that the spiritual those are those who humbly realize that they haven't yet arrived at a point where they themselves cannot fall into sin. See, they recognize they're in a battle, and they also recognize they can lose it at any given point if they're not dependent on the Spirit. That they could consume could succumb to sin, just like the person they're trying to help. He said in verses 25 in, to the beginning of 26 there, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited. At the end of verse 1, he'll warn, considering yourselves, lest you also be tempted. Never think when you go to restore a brother or sister caught in a sin that it can't happen to you. See, I think we always should think there, but by the grace of God, go I. I remember some years ago, we had a man who was an elder in our church, and he moved to Texas to take a different job, and his wife and kids had to stay behind for a while while they were selling their house and getting ready to sell. He was gone for a month or two, and he would come home on the weekend sometimes. And he had stopped serving as an elder because he was he had moved. And we found out that he, while he was away, had fallen into an affair with another woman. He left his wife. I made a trip to Texas to confront him. In fact, I went to his apartment where he was staying, and I sat on the hood of the car that we would rented, and I looked at his apartment waiting for him to come home. And he drove by with the woman, saw me, and left. It was about 10 o'clock or so. And 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning, I was still sitting there when he finally came back without her. And I talked to him until after the sun come up, came up and he wouldn't repent. You know what I kept thinking? Man, if it could happen to him, it could happen to me. 
And what I realized, thank you, Lord, that you gave me the humility to realize that. Because now you protect me from the same thing. Because it's not that I'm naturally humble like that. It's a supernatural thing. If you ever see anything that even looks similar to humility in me, you can be sure that's the work of the Holy Spirit. So that's not me. So we've looked here about a little bit who needs restoration, who should be doing it. We've already started to hint at how it should be done. So that's what we're going to focus on now, how the restoration should be done. Paul has at least two things to say about this. First, I think Paul would say restoration must be done caringly. I think this is indicated when Paul says that restoration should be done in a spirit of gentleness. Here he's actually recalling an aspect, again, of the fruit of the Spirit that he mentioned in chapter 5, verse 23. This word translated gentleness in most modern translations can also be translated as meekness, as it is in the King James Version. The analytical lexicon of the Greek New Testament defines it as a quality of gentle friendliness. So it can mean gentleness or meekness, which it describes as strength that accommodates to another's weakness. Meekness doesn't mean weakness. It's a strength that accommodates to the weakness of another. Or it can sometimes just mean consideration, caring. Jesus, who was God incarnate, demonstrated this attribute in his gentle calling to his disciples, didn't he? In Matthew 11, verses 28 and 29, we read of our Lord Jesus, his, these words that he spoke. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle. That's the same word there. It's the... Rather, the adjective that's related to the noun that we've used. I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So, Jesus is the ultimate example of strength that accommodates to another's weakness. His approach to people. After all, he's God himself accommodating to our weakness. And we're to follow his example when we seek to restore a fallen brother or sister in Christ. We're to be Christ-like when we do it. We too are to be gentle and lowly of heart as we confront their sin and encourage them to repent. And when Paul refers to a spirit of gentleness or meekness, he may simply mean that we should have an attitude or a demeanor that's Christ-like, that's gentle, that's meek. But it's also possible that he means that we, sh we should restore a fallen brother by the spirit who produces gentleness. Because remember, he's described it in the context as a gift of the spirit. Either way, and certainly both are appropriate, in the context, gentleness is definitely the attitude or demeanor we must have. And gentleness is definitely also that which comes only through the power of the Holy Spirit. No wonder we have to be led by the Spirit. It's only by His power that any of this can be done for the glory of God. That Christ might be magnified in our lives. So it must be done caringly, gently, in a Christ-like way. And secondly, restoration must be done cautiously. I think this is indicated when Paul says, Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. The word translated considering here indicates being sharply attentive, very diligent. And the fact that it's in the present tense indicates continually doing this. When you're, when you're seeing a brother or sister overtaken in a sin, and you're fulfilling your responsibility to restore them, you've got to be constantly on your guard. And that means you're going to have to be constantly dependent on the Spirit, right? To protect you, to keep you humble, to make you realize that you too could fall. And then you're ready to help someone else, like you should.
We need to be constantly on our guard. I remember uh, someone I met in Bible college who had struggled with homosexual sin in his past and had come out of that. And he was one of those uh, men like the ones in Corthopo wrote about when he said, but such were some of you, <laughs> right? And he'd come out of that. And he was married, I think, when, at the time this happened. And he thought God would have him have a ministry to men who struggled that way. And as a young believer, he tried to reach out to another young man. And you know what happened? Oh, through the time of his relationship trying to help him, he succumbed to sin again with him. You see, he was not at a point where he should be doing that yet. He was not mature enough to handle that. And he did not keep on his guard. And he ended up repenting and being restored. And I don't think it ever happened again. I think he learned a hard lesson that way. But I think he found out what Paul was talking about. See, he thought he'd achieved such victory. It could never happen again. And he found out he was wrong. In fact, that might have been his first mistake. I mentioned that elder before. When I confronted him, who cheated on his wife and left her, when I confronted him, he said something to me. He said, you know, Keith, I never thought this would happen to me. And I thought to myself, that was his first mistake. God, don't let me make that mistake. Don't ever let me think there's not a sin that couldn't happen to me. Help me always to humbly depend on your grace. Man, if it could happen to him. It could happen to me. It could happen to you. So that's the attitude I think we should have. If you see someone caught in a sin, your first response should be, oh Lord, it's only but by your grace that that's not me. And it's only by your grace that that won't be me. Right? And keep me humble as I seek to go to them. So I give him one example of how we might be tempted to sin. Paul doesn't say exactly how we'd be tempted to sin. We might be tempted to fall into the same sin as the one we're trying to help. I give an example of that of someone I knew. But he might think we'd be tempted to be harsh or unforgiving in our confrontation. And he wants us to avoid that kind of a sin. Or maybe he thinks we'd be tempted to be prideful and feel superior to them. And he wants us to avoid that kind of sin. I don't think it's a, you know, choose A, B, or C. I think it's D, all of the above. Be on your guard against any kind of sin you could commit in this situation. Because we're in a spiritual battle. And our flesh wants to sin in all these ways. And we have to keep in step with the Spirit for that not to happen. I think Paul definitely has at least that last problem in mind because he goes on to say in verse 3, if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. He definitely at least has the fact that we could be arrogant here in mind. Pride will certainly get in the way of our effectiveness in bearing one another's burdens by restoring one another. But you know what else it'll do? It'll keep us from loving one another. And that leads us to our second major point. So we're getting out of the tall weeds of subpoints. Whew, back to a major point now. Uh, point number two, finally, right? We bear one another's burdens by loving one another. This is what I think we discover at the end of verse two when he says, and so fulfill the law of Christ. I think that Paul means by that that we must love one another. Because that is what he means when he speaks of the law of Christ. This becomes clear if we look back again earlier in the context, this time back into chapter 5, verses 13 and 14, where Paul says, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled... In one word, even this, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says in Galatians 2, 6, if we restore one another and bear one another's burdens, as he said, we will fulfill the law of Christ. I think he's using the same 
terminology here to recall what he had said earlier. What is the law of Christ? It's love one another. I think he probably even has what Jesus said to the disciples in the upper room in mind when Jesus said in John 13, verses 34 and 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. We could also say, this is how to be spiritual. This is what a real spiritual person is like. He trusts in Christ and he has Christ-like love. So we bear one another's burdens by loving one another, or better still, we love one another by bearing one another's burdens in this passage. So in this passage, we have this general moral obligation to love one another, fulfilling the law of Christ, leading to this general principle of bearing one another's burdens. And we've seen a specific application of that. Restoring one another which is where we spent most of our time. So we restore father, fallen brethren at the end of the day because it's just a loving thing to do. It's just what you do when you love someone. Let us never think then that we're truly loving others if we neglect to confront a persistent sin in their lives. In fact, we would do well, I think, to remember the original context of the command to love your neighbor as yourself. Remember the original context in which that command was given? The second great law. Well, the first is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and strength. And the second is like it. You must love your neighbor as yourself. That comes from Leviticus 19. But most people don't quote the context when they refer to it. So I'm going to, because it fits what we're talking about this morning. Here's what it says in Leviticus 19, 17 and 18. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance. So when you're going to confront a sin, you can't be vengeful about it, right? You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. You see people caught in sin, you got to rebuke. Because if you don't rebuke it, you're hating them. You can't be vengeful and you can't let it turn into a grudge, what you're discovering and seeing and dealing with. And then he says, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. That's the context in which that command was given. If loving others is the most important command and restoring others, though, is just one application of how we might do that in line with the original giving of the command to love one another, does that mean it exhausts the way in which we can bear one another's burdens? Of course it doesn't. We've seen an example in the prayer time earlier this morning that it doesn't do that. There were burdens being borne this morning in the prayer time. As a family had their Christian family all around them, lifting them up in prayer and sharing the load. A couple of ways that we can bear one another's burdens, I'd suggest to you more generally, would be to bear one another's economic burdens. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians after noting the example of sacrificial giving by the Macedonian churches, Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 8, 8 and following. I speak not by commandment, but I'm testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. He's used this other example to prod them to be more like this. But the Macedonians aren't like they are just because they're great people. It's because Christ has done something. So he's got to point them to Christ as the ultimate example. And so he says in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. And in this I give advice. It is to your advantage not only to be doing what you began to do, were desiring to do a year ago. They'd started a collection and kind of fallen off of taking it, right? 
He says, but now you also must complete the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to desire it, so there also may be a completion of what you have. For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted according to what one has and not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack and their abundance also may supply your lack, that there may be equality. As it is written, he was gathered much, had nothing left over, and he was gathered little, had no lack. There's a way to bear one another's burdens economically. I don't have to become poor to help a poor brother. My goal is that neither one of us be poor. Right? That we share. That we spread the burden. And we carry one another's load. So we could do it that way, or we could bear one another's emotional burdens. This is the kind of thing Paul also had in mind in 2 Corinthians. This time in chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, when he wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. I love to hear God described that way, don't you? I need comfort all the time. Who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. With the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. He's talking about sharing emotional burdens there, I think. When people are in trials and tribulations, there's a weight on them. But we've been comforted by God in times like that, and we can share his comfort with them. There was a lot of that going on earlier here today. As Paul put it in another place in Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. There's some of that going on here today too. So I'm really preaching to the choir. You guys have all got this down already, right? I hope. I'd like to conclude simply by observing that Paul's teaching here assumes that as we mature as Christians, as we learn to be more spiritual, which is to say spirit-led and dependent upon God, that we will bear one another's burdens. See, there's something ugly about somebody who's been a Christian a long time and knows a lot about the Christian faith and who's selfish. There's something terribly wrong with that picture. And though they may appear spiritual because they have so much knowledge, Paul wouldn't call them spiritual at all. In fact, he might say something like, knowledge pops up. But if we're going to bear one another's burdens, doesn't this mean we also have to share them? You know, it's easier to share a financial burden sometimes, or maybe even for some people it's hard, or to share an emotional burden. How about the sin burden he had in mind? How many of us are comfortable sharing that? Do we always have to wait for somebody to notice and point it out? Or are we going to share it? I think James would say, there's a time to share it. Confess your sins, your trespasses to one another, he says, and pray for one another. You may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. He could have even said, the effective, fervent prayer of a spiritual man avails much. So maybe you don't feel like you're very spiritual because you're caught in a sin. But you've got a bunch of people in this room who are spiritual and who can help you with your burden. So while they have an obligation to do that, I would suggest that you might have an obligation to avail yourself of that help that you can have if you're in that position. I mean, only God knows all of our hearts. I don't know most of you, so I just know me. And I know that sometimes I'm spiritual enough to help others, and at other times... <laughs> 
I'm glad they're spiritual enough to help me. Let's pray. Holy Father, I hope that I've been able to correctly bring out the lessons that I think you intended us to learn uh, through Galatians on this subject. And I, I ask, Lord, that you would forgive us. I think I can speak for all of us when I say, please forgive us for the ways in which we lack the maturity that maybe we ought to already have. Forgive us, Lord. Help us learn to be more spiritual and help us to remember that it really is an easy place to start. The solution isn't easy, it's, but it is simple. We just got to remember we're saved by grace through faith alone and we're utterly dependent on your spirit. We just got to cry out to you again. Humble ourselves before you again. Ask you to lead us, convict us, guide us, fill us with the fruit of the Spirit anew. And Lord, for anyone here who's been caught in a sin, I pray that he or she today would be emboldened. Maybe others haven't noticed it. Maybe they've kept it private. Maybe they've been keeping the devil's secret. Maybe the hold that sin has on them is precisely because they haven't shared it with a spiritual person or persons around them. Lord, deliver them today, I pray. Help them to quit keeping the devil's secret and confess that sin and get help. To you, confess it to you first and to others who can help them. For anyone here who's not yet come to know you, whose burden of sin is sending them straight to hell, it is our prayer for that person that he or she today would realize that Christ died on the cross for sinners like everyone in this room, and he rose from the dead that we might have everlasting life. And that is a free gift. All we have to do is trust you and accept it. Please, Lord, do for them what you've done for us. Open their eyes that they may see. Grant them faith and repentance. And we'll give you all the glory for what you do, Lord, as a result of our time together in your word because we are convinced more today than even yesterday that you and you alone deserve all the glory for anything good in us. We pray these things in the name of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.